series. How about the, whoa, okay. <laughs> it works. And I can do just as well holding this. Does it sound all right? Okay. I just don't want to shout this morning. Sinuses and all that. The voice is not as strong. The title of the message this morning is We're Only Human. Boy, does that apply today, okay? Uh, and somebody's phone is going. It's not for me. I guarantee it, okay? All right. By the way, turn all your phones off. A few weeks ago, I asked you to turn them on. Remember that? <laughs> if you'd turn them off, it'd be a whole lot better. So we uh, don't get interrupted there. Um, let's look at the, the map that we have, first of all, to show you where we're going where we've been and where we're going in this. In Luke chapter um, 14, we're going to be looking 8 through 20. The, so far, the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas, it started here at Antioch, <clears throat> went down to Salamis, then to Paphos, and then they took a 200-mile boat ride from here up to Perga. All right. Was it batteries or what? Just who knows? Okay, how do I do this? Make the switch. Oh. <laughs> Cut it. Oh. I'm frozen in the middle here. Hello. How about now? Coming through, coming through, coming through. Yeah. Testing, testing. I'm like, okay, good. All right, that took five minutes of my sermon, so we're going over five minutes today, okay? <laughs> All right, so we're looking at 200 miles from here to here. From here, Perga up to Antioch, the city in Antioch is another 100, and that was on foot. Okay, so they really love the people of Pisidian Antioch. From Pisidian Antioch to Iconium, another 80 miles. No, yeah, another 80 miles. And from Iconium down to Lystra, where we're at today, is between 18 and 20. Then you got to go, it doesn't look like it, but it's another 40 down to Derby. Um, so these guys, they really love the Lord. And they love the people that they were ministering to. And we have them today in chapter 14 in verse 8. They're in the, the Lystra that you see on the map. And let's just read it. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. Now, this is a doctor's determination, Dr. Luke, of what was wrong with this guy. And he's stressing the hopelessness of this man. He, had, he was without strength, lame from birth. He's never walked. He just emphatic, boom, 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 three times. And this was an opportunity then to confirm their message, Paul and Barnabas' message, with a miraculous sign, as they did earlier in verse 3, where it talks about they were testifying uh, by the, to the word of his grace, granted and granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. So let's continue on. So they're at Lystra. And this man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying in the Lycaonian language, apparently Paul didn't understand this language, it's a dialect from the local area um, that Derby and Lystra and the Iconium were in, they, they, um, they, they, because he didn't really know what they were saying. He had to catch on, because they were saying, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they begin calling Barnabas Zeus. Now you may have Jupiter there in some of your translations, that's a Latin form, the right word is just God, it's just dia. And um, so they took the Greek god Zeus and uh, Jupiter for the Romans. And Paul, Hermes, now that's the right word. You may have the word Mercury there. But again, that's the Latin. But in the Greek, it's actually Hermes. And Hermes was a messenger and he, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with crowds. Uh, and when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? Why are also, uh, we are also men of the same nature as you. And we preach the gospel to you, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, 
who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. I think we'll just stop there and uh, move on because uh, we're going to see some, uh, some points here that Paul was trying to make to the crowd about who God was because they had been convinced that there were false gods. They were worshiping these Greek gods. Uh, one was uh, Zeus, the leader of all the gods in the Greek mind, and Hermes, who was the messenger of all the gods. And they said, oh, wow, this is what, what we got here. So the first point on your outline in the bulletin is that false gods and religions are deceptive. Very much so. Deceptive is the word. There was a tradition that was recorded by the Roman uh, uh, poet Ovid, and he did it in AD 17. And it said that once Zeus and Hermes, these two gods of the Greeks, they had come down to earth and they were disguised as men. And, but nobody in the land would give them hospitality until two old peasants, one was named Philemon and his wife, took them in. And as a result, they were so mad at the rest of the world that they wiped them out with a flood, except for these two, husband and wife. And they were made the guardians of this splendid temple that they changed their house into this splendid temple and were turned, when they died, they're actually turned into two green trees when they died. And you say, well, that's the silliest thing I ever heard. Well, these people didn't think so. They actually believed it, apparently, or at least in the, they were acting like they did. It's because when Paul and Barnabas healed this crippled man, the people of Lystra, they were determined to not make the same mistake again. Do you get that? They had this tradition. This is how traditions can mess you up. You know, bad ones. Good tradition, bad tradition. This was a bad tradition. And they felt that the gods had visited them again. Here's the same story repeating itself. Zeus and Hermes, here they are again. They're testing us again. So instead of casting them out and even hearing what they had to say, they, uh, they wanted to make them gods and start worshiping them. So Barnabas must have been this man of noble presence as uh, they took him for Zeus, Jupiter, king of the gods. And then Hermes, or Mercury, it's Hermes actually, was the messenger of the gods. And since Paul spoke a lot, they said he must be the messenger of Zeus. So they, they called him Hermes. Now, of course, this story of Zeus and Hermes is only fiction. It, it wasn't true. But it was one that the people of Lystra apparently lived in fear of. They were afraid of this. And they did it so much that when God Almighty showed his power through the healing of this man, the people credited gods who were no gods with that miracle. They decided to worship gods that didn't even exist with this miracle that Paul had performed rather than face the truth. So this was uh, what, what happened. They were deceived. Why would they do that? They were deceived. And this reason that they assumed that Paul and Barnabas were these two false gods was the same reasons that false religions and cults sprang up even today. They were deceived. Now, those without the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're easily deceived because they have no solid point of reference. If you don't have the Bible as the point of reference for your life, you're going to be drawn into all kinds of things. It's God's infallible, his, his trustworthy word for all humanity. And, and that's why there are so many religions and strange and bizarre cults in the world today, and they are getting weirder. You wouldn't believe how many cults are springing up involving aliens. It's incredible. There's a guy in the museum the other day. He talked about aliens. Do you think the aliens did this when I was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah? I said, no, let's go to the Bible, give you the right answer. Uh, you see, Satan has blinded their spiritual eyes and deceived them. That's why this happens. There's a good verse in the Bible. Paul put it this way. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And this is Paul talking again, and he says, And even if our gospel is veiled, 
it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, Satan, he's often referred to as the deceiver in Scripture. And uh, even Jesus in John 8, 44, he referred to him as uh, the, the devil as the liar and the father of all lies. So what has happened in our world? What was happening in their world? Satan has been at this for thousands of years, and he's pretty good at it. And we see a greater departure from the truth and the things of God now more than at any time in history. Uh, there's, there's never been a time when so many people in so many places have been deceived by so many deceptions. And Paul tells us this is one of the signs that we are in the last days before the return of Jesus Christ. So he said in 2 Timothy 3.13, he said that in that day, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You'd be surprised how many people have been duped by the enemy of their souls. And those who believe that God will not judge sin um, in the great judgment, or that there is another way to God besides Jesus Christ, or that their good deeds are sufficient to save them, you know what? They're simply deceived. He deceives us in so many ways, our world in so many ways, into believing that sin isn't really sinful or bad. He deceives us into believing that we can handle our problems on our own or run our own lives without any help from God or his power. He deceives us into believing that we should live by what we feel instead of what God commands us to do through a scripture. So how do you keep yourself from being deceived? By making the word of God your final word. Did you get that? You make the word of God your final word. If the Bible clearly teaches something, backed up, of course, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, uh, that, then that settles it, uh, the end of discussion, and, and make that the rule of your life. I'm going to move quickly on to the second point, or else we won't get through those today. Uh, the second point is that the only antidote to, tru to deception is truth. And again, in verses 14 and 15, how did Paul respond to the situation? Well, he simply told them the truth. He started proclaiming the gospel as the antidote to the deception that they had experienced all their lives. How do you respond to deception when those have been deceived uh, that you come in contact with? You respond by proclaiming the word of truth, the gospel. And uh, verses 14 and 15 says that Paul and Barnabas were so upset that they, the people had mistook them for gods that they tore their clothes that's a sign of distress. They just, oh, no, rip. You know? they, would, they were so stressed out from this. And they, they ran in among the people. And what did they do? They started preaching to them, bringing forth the truth of who they were. And the only infallible source for truth is the word of God. And if that is true, then you and I had better become a student of the word of God, right? And read it study it, go and hear it taught and preach, discuss it, memorize it, meditate upon it. Finally, we get to know the Word of God, and uh, not only the Word of God, but get to know the God of the Word. That's the key factor in understanding the Word of God, knowing the God who wrote it. All right, move on to the next point. Uh, that is simply, we are all human. Remember that statement Paul made? When he came out and he said, hey, don't do that. We're humans just like you are. We're all humans in verse 15. So to become a God in that day or to be proclaimed a God was one of the highest goals of men in the Roman and the Greek world. If you were a military victor and you, in the Roman world and you, you had just won a great victory, you would be paraded and heralded for one day as a god. The people would worship you as god. If you won the Greek games, the Olympic game winners, they would be pronounced gods. If you were, if you were a Caesar, you were proclaimed god for life. 
You were, you were, this was the goal of humanity, to elevate themselves and to be God. It was every young man's goal. Let me, let me be a God for a day. Let me do this. It was, to be sure, an awkward moment for Paul and Barnabas, though, wasn't it? Can you imagine what people wanting to fall down and worship you? And when they learned of what the people were saying, remember, I think they were speaking and says they were speaking in Lycaonian, and they didn't really know what it was. Uh, but when they realized what was going on, and when they learned that a priest of Zeus, he was bringing bulls in with garlands around their neck to offer sacrifice to them, they rushed out into the crowd. They shouted within the crowd in verse 15, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human just like you are. They tore their clothes as a way to show their shock and dismay at what the crowd was doing. I got a, another mu message coming somewhere out there. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> okay. Now, so far from wanting to be idolized, these two apostles, uh, they counter the crowd by letting them know that they are just like them. They're, they're humans. And now, we're humans. We're not intended to be gods. You, none of you would make a very good god. Uh, we're, we're human. We're not divine. We're not worthy to be sacrificed to. The very notion would have made Paul and Barnabas sick at their stomachs. The crowd was making idols of them. Now, how does this relate to us today? In this day and age, people strive to be idols. TV shows that have idol, American Idol, other idols, uh, today musicians, actors, sports figures, politicians, even preachers, you name it. We like the attention. It's part of that human thing. We like to be put up on a pedestal. We like to think that we are above everyone else in some way. Uh, we, we like to have that idea, well, it certainly won't happen to me. It happens to everybody else. It won't happen to me. And I'm above that because, and, or the Bible doesn't apply to me. It applies to them, not to me. So it's uh, the, the answer, but it does. And these things do happen to us. And even though we may be put up on a pedestal, we eventually will fall off because of circumstances in our life. This week I was reading an article about a former football player. And it's a very sad one to me because uh, Jim Plunkett, I, man, I like that guy. He's a great quarterback. He played at Stanford. And he, he had the type of uh, football career that plenty of people dream about. And a lot of people elevated him to, to, uh, uh, to a status that was higher, like we put sports figures at. He had won the Heisman Trophy. He was number one draft pick overall. He, he had two Super Bowls as starting quarterback for the Raiders. So, but now... Decades removed from the playing field, I think he's 60, 69 now. He shared what his life is like now, and uh, it's kind of tough. He's, he had, he's had 18 surgeries. He has artificial knees, an artificial shoulder. He's had operations on his back. And uh, he says that he takes 13 pills every day and then some others just for various issues. Six in the morning, seven at night. Um, he came down with Bell's palsy and they may, they, they may think it's all related and uh, he has headaches now. I mean, wow. Was it worth it? That moment? I think that all just proves to me and it should prove to you too is that we're all just human and we were not intended to be gods. And that's what Paul was trying to get across to these people. Now there's a, something else. Next point is simple. The gospel is the answer to humanity's needs. If you look at verse 15, it, it simply says that men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So he's saying the answer, of course, is the gospel. And it's to turn from the things you've been doing to the living God. Now, they didn't turn their backs on them, the, Paul and Barnabas did, and just, just wipe the dust off their shoes at them because they did this. They used this opportunity to address the mob. And they told them, we're bringing you good news. That's the gospel. Not these worthless things you've been doing. We're talking about good news now. 
because you don't have any good news in these false gods. And that's far uh, from the ancient Greeks or Roman gods who, who carried very little or not at all for humans. Uh, the true God, the living God, wanted them to have good news that would change their life. And that gets to the next point real quick, and that's uh, get, to, get to know the true God. And this is one of the power points of this sermon, powerful points of this sermon, is that uh, it, it's, it's a short sermon from Paul about who God is. And he's saying, you know, you're trying to know the wrong gods that you can never know. He said, you didn't even recognize us. We, are, we aren't gods, but you thought we were. You have no concept of what your God is about. He says, get to know the God that I'm offering you. And he, show, he chose these things to show the people unmistakably that the God of the Bible was totally different from the false gods they were worshiping. And, uh, and ultimately, he is pointing them to Jesus as their Savior. First thing he says under this, and you can see it point by point now, is uh, the first point is he's alive. He's a living God. He says he wanted to point him to the living God. And unlike all the other so-called gods, the idols and gods that they worshipped were not living because they did not, in fact, even exist. So they weren't living. They were just images of stone and wood. There was nothing truly behind these idols. And, and, and the gods they worshipped were merely myths. And they were giving their life to this sort of thing. But the God that he was pointing them to was living. He was alive, always has been, and still will be. Second point he makes about him is that he's the creator of all things. Now, some Greeks and Romans, they believe the prevailing myth of the creation uh, of the world, that they had a God called chaos, and out of this chaos uh, came everything. And then they believed some had a form of evolution that they taught. And Paul was trying to expose these errors and tell them about the true God. He says, this God is the creator of all things. He's the one that is the answer to everything. He created the heavens above and the universe and the land as well as the sea and everything in the land and sea. I think that <clears throat> what he's trying to get across is what he explained later in the book of Romans. Over in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, listen to what, this is the, the God that he's getting, uh, trying to portray, portray to them. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been seen clearly, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now, remember, it's important to realize that this... Uh, that, that nothing has ravaged the gospel and gospel preaching to the untaught world more than a, the theory of evolution. Uh, straight from Satan himself, because he knows it works. It was working back then, and Paul was countering that with his message even then, 2,000 years ago. And because, why is it so, so bad? Because it poses an explanation of the existence of everything without a creator. People who accept it fail to see any need for God uh, or a first cause. And what Paul is saying in Romans 1, he said, God is the first cause. He's the beginning of everything. And they, thus they, they cut themselves off. If you're a, a real proponent of evolution, uh, true uh, evolution, you, uh, you cut themselves off from creation, even reason and conscience are de that, that, that are designed to do exactly that, lead them to the one true God. So I believe that this philosophy is the greatest enemy of the gospel today, and it turns more and more people away. So, so what was Paul doing here? Israel had received a special revelation through the Holy Scriptures, and it was the law, and they knew about the one God, and through the Bible, they had special revelation. The pagan nations, they didn't have that. And they, what, they received the message of God through what Romans 1 talks about and Paul's talking about here through what's called natural or general revelation. It's where you can look out and see nature and say there must be a God behind it. And the reason and logic that God gave men should, 
inspire them to say, this is not something that just happened. This is something that should, you should say there's a cause behind it. There's a, a prime mover, so to speak, as philosophical terms. And that all ended, though, the pagan understanding of seeing God in nature and the Jewish understanding of the, the word of the Old Testament and the law uh, that all came together when Jesus Christ came into the world. In Acts 17.30, a later message, Paul says that having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that are everywhere, that all everywhere should repent. When Jesus came into the world, the, he ended this, uh, this understanding that you can only know God through nature or God reveals himself only through nature. Now we have what's called specific revelation through Jesus Christ. So there is no excuse. That's why the Romans comes back in Romans 1.20 and says that even without the law of the Old Testament, men have creation. They have provision that testifies to God's existence, and the rational consciences c contain the moral law of God. And, and in Romans 1.20, it points to all this and says, you know what? No man has an excuse anymore. We are all without excuse. And what Paul was doing here in this passage to a people that didn't know about the law of God, but they knew a lot about nature, and he does it again in chapter 17 when he's in Athens. He's bringing these pagans from the natural, general revelation of God through creation to the specific revelation of God through Jesus Christ so that all men can come to God through Jesus Christ. Now, you are without excuse in our world today. Um, we, we can look and we have the natural revelation, but it's very clear, especially in this country, and the, the specific revelation of God is found through Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are all without excuse. One more point here, a couple more, is that God is long-suffering. In, in generations gone by, he permitted all nations to go their own ways. But the Bible says over in 2 Peter 3, 9, the reason that God hasn't brought judgment upon the world and put an end to all things is pretty simple. It says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. But he's patient. He's long-suffering toward you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So here you got another message of the love of God in Christ. And then finally it says he's good. Uh, he's good. He's benevolent. And it, you, you see there was nothing good about the false gods that they had. If you look and study the pagan gods of Rome and Greece, what a mess they were. They didn't have any compassion for humanity at all. You have Zeus in their writings was an adulterer and a rapist. Cronus, the titan, Zeus's father, he ate all his children except Zeus and only became, uh, because of his wife's deception at that, uh, Hades kidnapped his bride against her will. Demeter, the goddess of harvest, she start, tried to starve the world to death. Poseidon raped the beautiful mistress Medusa in one of the Athena's temples. Athena helped Perseus murder Medusa. It just gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And I could go on and on, but you get the idea. The Greek gods were evil. They were vindictive. They were hateful. They were proud. They were predatory of women. I could go on and on. But Paul said the true God that he was proclaiming was in control of all things. And in his dealings with humanity, he's always good, he's always benevolent, he's always kind, he's always merciful, he's always loving, and he does good things for mankind so that we will see that there is a God. And we want to come to that God and know that God. And it causes us to turn to that God for salvation and to love him. And that leads to the final point, point he's giving. You see, unfortunately... And Paul was not able to finish his sermon. Uh, Dave will get into that next week because isn't it funny how the people who were trying to pr pronounce them as gods in the next few minutes, they're taking them out and stoning them to death. Uh, it, it's a crazy thing. He was not able to finish his sermon and get to the most important part. 
And then verses 18 and 19 says that the crowd got out of hand. They took Paul outside the city, stoned him, left him to dead. Uh, he, 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 had he been able to continue his sermon, you and I know the rest of the sermon, don't we? It's what he preached elsewhere. He would have told them that the ultimate way God showed his benevolence to humanity is by sending his son to live a sinless life and to die for the sins of all men. And then if that, they would just put their faith in Jesus Christ. He would forgive them of their sins. And he would become their loving, merciful, kind father and, and grant them eternal life. So here is the summary of everything. Get to know the God who is alive and working in all things to bring about his perfect will for your life. And get to know the God who is the creator of all things. Through not just natural revelation, but the specific revelation of Jesus Christ. The God who is powerful and can do wonders in your life if you obey and follow him. And get to know the God who is long-suffering. Don't worry, you haven't gone too far. You haven't done anything that's too bad for God to say, Oh, sorry, that's the end, can't do anything for you. But no, God is long-suffering. It's not too late yet. And he will forgive you. And you can be clear and clean if you only turn back and repent. And then get to know the God who is good and kind and benevolent. And get to know the God who gives. Now that is demonstrated greatly, probably the best in Scripture, in that Scripture we all know, John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? If you have never received this wonderful God, you know there's a God. You wouldn't be here this morning if you wouldn't, didn't believe that there was a God. Some of you uh, have probably... Uh, not reach the point where you've claimed him as Lord. We gave many of you an opportunity to do that earlier, but you haven't reached that point. I challenge you to move beyond just the knowledge that there is a God, as we have in general and natural revelation through the, what he was addressing these people in uh, Lystra, but move on to the specific revelation of God that is found through Jesus Christ. And this is where you say, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ did die for me. I believe I am sinful, but Jesus has taken care of that through his death on the cross. And I'm calling on you to forgive me of my sin, to give me a new life, to grant me eternal life and a new purpose in life, and to be fulfilled in my life. So, Lord, I pray that this is happening with people here today. And... Uh, if, if whatever is going on in their lives, I pray that you will speak to them and let them know the need to call on you. You are the answer, and you are the one we can, we can really look to for the guidance in our life. You are the great God of the universe and the God of creation and the God who sent Jesus to, to satisfy the needs of the soul. And we pray this thanking you in Jesus' name. Amen. But we're going to do better be up here. I'll be up here if you'd like to come for prayer. We're going to sing a neat song about the God of creation. Let's stand together.